But let me just remind you of what a biblical world is. Uh, there are seven divisions of it. And I could have divided it up differently, but this is, th- these are some of the basics that you and I need to understand in order to have a, a lens through which we see the world and, and understand how we do the things we do. The first one, obviously, is that there is a God, and He is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator and ruler of the universe. As I told you before, you basically only only have two choices and they are both faith systems since you cannot go back and prove um, the creation of the world from nothing by itself nor can you prove it with God uh, it is whether or not you have evidence for one or the other I personally believe there is more evidence for a divine creator because of the design of the universe uh, number two Absolute and unchanging moral truths exist because of the nature of God. This is a tough one, but at the same time, if you don't understand that God is not just a great grandpa in the sky who gets mad and says, don't, 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 no, 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 no. It's because He is who He is. Whether you like it or not, He is all of His attributes combined and... uh, Moral truth exists because of that. If you don't believe in a God with, with uh, some moral absolutes, then you have a tough time coming up with any. Number three, this is where we are tonight, the second part of this. God has revealed himself and his truth in the Bible, which is inerrant and accurate in all it teaches. We'll talk some more about that. Number four, Satan is a real being created by God who opposes God's rule and his dominion over the world. Number five, Jesus Christ was sent from God to live a sinless life and die and rise again. You've got to get the resurrection in there. He did that for the sins of the world to reconcile men to God. Uh, Number six, salvation is a free gift of God, cannot be earned. And then finally, number seven, Christians have a responsibility to share the truth with the world. And with those in mind, we are looking tonight at the second part of this third foundational statement. God has revealed himself and his truth in the Bible, which is inerrant and accurate in all it teaches. Last week, we looked at the issues of revelation, the fact that God revealed himself, and he did it both in natural revelation and by way of special revelation through his word. Uh, We talked about inspiration. I'll remind you of that definition in just a moment. Uh, But tonight, this week, we're going to be talking about the issue of inerrancy. It has been a pivotal battleground among Christendom. There are many who do not believe that the Bible as a book is a uh, a book without error. I personally believe if it has error in it, it doesn't give evidence of coming from God. That doesn't mean this isn't a, uh, an issue that, that has some issues in it. So we're going to talk about that. Biblical inspiration, as we talked about it last week, is God's superintending, his, his watching over, his superintendence of human authors so that using their own personalities and characteristics... Uh, I suspect if if they were writing the way I would write, they'd put a few y'alls in there and so forth. They, They use their own personalities and characteristics. You see that in the written word. But they recorded without error God's revelation to man in the words of the original manuscripts. That we talked about last week. This week... I want to talk about the issue of inerrancy. Folks, inerrancy is dependent upon God's work, His uh, processes through which He gives us the Word, and either He protected it or He did not. Now, you have to ask, is there any evidence, any, any clues as to the fact that if God gave us the written Word, He would be able to keep it pure and without error? I want to show you this. I hope this is not confusing, but think through this with me. The process of special revelation, 
Remember, natural revelation is what you see uh, of God in, in creation, uh, what you uh, in, uh, inherently know about God in your conscience. That's, that's natural revelation. Special revelation starts with God. He is the one who decided he would reveal himself to us. Now, he did that in his written word, the Bible. He did it in the living word, Jesus Christ. God not only sent a letter, but he sent a person. But when you look at how he did it, he worked through a human method. Now think about that with me for a moment. When God gave his written word, he worked through human writers. Uh, we're not sure exactly how many. We would generally say there were over 40 different writers of the scripture over a period of 1,500 years. Uh, three different languages. Uh, you have Hebrew, you have Aramaic in the Old Testament, and then you have Greek in the New uh, over a period of some 1,500 years, and yet one, one book. He used writers, human writers. He also used a human woman to give us the living word. So we've got the written word, the living word. God did work through humans. What's the problem in working with humans? Limitation. Sin. Error. But see, you also have to understand on the other side, God was the divine mediator. He was the one who protected the process. And, and he did that through his Holy Spirit. He did that with the written word. He did it with the living word. Let me take you back to a couple of thoughts here. He did it so that we could get the written word without error and so that Jesus himself would be without sin. Luke chapter 1. I know Christmas has passed and we uh, read this back then, but here it is again. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel asked, How can this be? She, she's going to have a baby. You, you remember the con context. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. Pastor, what does that mean? I have no idea. It doesn't explain it. Well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So you have a, a human woman who had sin. In fact, she said, God, she said, God, my Savior. And in spite of the fact that our Roman Catholic friends say she was sinless, uh, she's the one who said she needed a Savior. Uh, and so you have the Holy Spirit superintending in a human woman so that Jesus was born without sin. Peter described the same process as he described for us how the Word of God came to be. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Peter said, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Now, let me stop right there. I, I want to explain other things, but I've got to stop. I do not like that translation, because what it sounds like is Peter is saying, why, you can't come to the Word of God and interpret for yourself. Uh, that's what it sounds like in English. What Peter was saying is uh, the prophecies of Scripture that we've got, it literally says it doesn't come out of oneself. No man decided one day, oh, I think I will sit down and write a Scripture. Oh, I think, I think I'm going to write Psalms. I think I'll write Acts. No, it didn't come out of any one by their own effort, by their own will. No, he says, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So there again, we have the process through which the Holy Spirit, working with human beings, gave us the Word of God without error. The living Word, Jesus, human mother, without sin. The written word, uh, the logos, the, the rhema, the word of God as we have it, 
Holy Spirit superintending without error. Ed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is Second Peter. In fact, it's down on this side of this page in my Bible. I don't know how I made an error like that. But it is Second Peter. That is correct. Now, we go back to Jesus. Did Jesus believe that the Word of God as He had it was without error? These are His words. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. He said, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law. That was the Old Testament scriptures. Until all is accomplished. Uh, if you learned this verse in the King James Version, it says not one what or what? Jot or tittle. Yeah, well, what is that? Let me show you. The smallest letter or stroke. Jesus said, not the smallest letter or the smallest stroke will pass away. The smallest letter in Hebrew is the yod. It is uh, sort of like an apostrophe. Uh, you get a fly speck on the page in Hebrew and you think you've got another letter. That's the yod, smallest letter. Jesus said the smallest little letter in Hebrew is not going to pass away from God's word, which again, all he had was the Old Testament. Or he said the smallest stroke. The letter in blue is a resh. The letter in red is a dalit. But if you look at them, it's hard to tell the difference except for that little part right there. That little stroke on the dalit makes the difference between what we would call an R and a D. And so Jesus said, from what he had of the Old Testament scriptures, not the smallest letter, not even the smallest part of a letter that would distinguish it from another is going to pass away from the law. That tells me every word, every letter was important. And of course, if you know anything about the transi transition, the transmission of the Old Testament scriptures, they were fanatical about copying them. And, of course, when you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and you see these copies that were written much, much, much later, the percentage of, of not even scribal error is amazing. I can't even copy down stuff uh, that well. Obviously, not with First Peter, at least. <laughs> now, when we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about the Word of God not having error in it. But... There's some things you need to understand of what that does not mean. Uh, this is where I think we get off sometimes by, by thinking it means this, that, or the other. And, and so I need to talk with you about what it does not mean in, in talking about inerrancy. Number one, it does not mean that the copies or the, I'll add to this, the translations are inerrant or inspired. Now, some of our fundamental Baptist friends believe that the King James Version is inspired. Uh, they can be rather dogmatic and quite honestly rather hateful about that. King James only, you know. I honestly would say to them kindly, that's heresy. God did not... Uh, give us an inerrant translation. All you have to do is look at the translation and you can see errors in the transmission of that. What inerrancy goes back to is the original. Now we don't have an original. It's through the process of, of what we call textual criticism and that's kind of a nasty word to some people. But if you look at three different uh, texts and you look and see, oh, this that obviously does not agree with this. How did that happen? You can see how those came about, and that's why they go back and, and try to give us what they consider the original text. Uh, scientific process, textual criticism. Although there are some pretty bad dudes who, who give us um, wrong theology because of it. Another totally different subject. Uh, number two, it does not mean that every declaration in Scripture is true. 
What inerrancy says is that the declaration was truly declared. He said, huh? What are you talking about? Let me give you an example. The Bible says there is no God. Is that true? Well, the statement itself is not true. But is it true that that statement is in the Bible? Yeah, but you put it in context. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The very fact that that statement is in there does not attest to the truth of the statement. It attests to the truth of the fact that the fool has said that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Number three, inerrancy does not mean that every statement of the Bible is scientifically accurate. You say, really? Oh, no. Not every statement is scientifically accurate. Psalm 113, verse 3. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. You know that the sun doesn't really rise. The sun doesn't really go down. So you can say, well, that's not scientific. But how many scientists do you know who, who get up with their spouse every morning and say, oh, honey, look, the great revolving of the, of the earth. It's, no. This is, this is the way we talk. It's, it, it's in metaphor. However, when the Bible makes scientific statements, you can believe that they are accurate. Let me, let me give you one of, the, uh, one of those statements. And I've wrestled with this one over the years. Genesis 1 says in seven days, the God, our God, or in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. I, I used to go along with those who said, well, it is possible that those word days don't mean 24-hour days or, or what we would normally think, except that when I go to Exodus, and I want to say it's Exodus 30 or 31, I'm talking off the cuff here, but in Exodus 30 um, or 31, it, it talks about how we are to work six days a week and rest on the seventh, and it uses... Uh, Genesis 1 as the, as the proof of that. It says, for in six days God created the heavens and the earth. That tells me from the point of Exodus, he was talking about 24-hour days. I would not hold anybody's feet to the fire for necessarily believing that. I think they are wrong to try to uh, put science and scripture together because I think true science fits scripture. But do your homework, see what you come up with there. I personally believe God did it in six days. Uh, by the way, um, Dr. Hugh Ross, well-known name, puts out plenty of books that says and it's not that, and he has some wonderful things to say. I just don't agree with him on that. Number five, it does not, inerrancy does not preclude the use of metaphors and figures of speech. Uh, for instance, one that you know of, John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus said, I am the door. Well, we believe in literal interpretation, but literally Jesus was talking figuratively. I mean, if the plain sense of Scripture makes good sense, seek no other sense, that would be nonsense. Jesus was not saying he was a wooden door. It's a metaphor. Now the problem is, there are passages that are difficult to determine whether the author was talking literally or figuratively. I, for instance, Ezekiel chapter 38 talks about a time, it says the king of the north, I take it Russia and those uh, areas up there, maybe including Syria. It says the king of the north will come down upon Israel at a time when their guard is down, when they have unwalled villages. And it says they will come with horses and, and spears and bows. That has not happened in history. That tells me, therefore, it is future. I have two choices. Was Ezekiel talking figuratively? Was he using the issue of horses and, and bows and arrows and so forth to talk in his view of what warfare was like? Or is it true that even in future times the Russians are going to come down with this on Israel with horses and spears? 
My tendency is to believe that Ezekiel was using figurative language. Cannot prove that. If the Russians indeed came down with horses and bows and arrows for some reason, that would, it, what I'm saying is there are passages where you just have a tough time understanding the figure of speech. For instance, book of Revelation. Usually John will tell you exactly what he means in using a metaphor. Or he will say it's like this or it's as this. But sometimes trying to figure it out is difficult. That doesn't take away from the fact that God gave it to us. He meant something by it. I don't always know what the figure of speech is. Oh, that's great. Use the same one there. Oh, yeah. It does not mean there are not some difficult passages and what some believe are errors. Now let's talk about some errors in the Bible. And folks, I have books in my library that are this thick about alleged errors in the Bible, discrepancies and so forth. Could not possibly go through. I couldn't even answer some of those on the spot. But I want to show you the types of things people say are errors. And I want to try to help you understand why I have no problem saying the Word of God is without error. For instance, differences in numbers. Let me take you to some passages. Acts chapter 7, verse 14. Stephen is speaking before he's stoned to death. Uh, he's giving us a history of the Old Testament. And he says... Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him. How many people? Seventy-five persons in all. That's what Stephen said. Hmm. We go back to Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were seventy in number. But Joseph was already in Egypt. Hmm. Acts 7 says there's 75. Exodus 1 says there's 70. This is often purported as an error. Let's talk about some possible answers for it. Uh, first of all, it is interesting that the Greek translation of the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls both use the number 75 rather than 70. And yet you have our other Hebrew manuscripts that say 70. So it says to me there could be a possible manuscript error when you've got these two, the Greek manuscript of the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scroll saying 75, but you have another manuscript saying 70. Okay, somebody may have copied something wrong. Can't prove that, but that's a possibility. Number two... Stephen gave details based on two different counts. Now, we can show you this. For instance, in the Hebrew text, you have this number. You have Jacob and his wife, two. But in the Greek text, they're not counted. In the Hebrew text, Jacob's sons are numbered as 12. In the Greek text, you have 12. In the Hebrew text, you have Jacob's grandsons and great sons numbered at 54. In the Greek text, 54. Jacob's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, you have two and two. You have Jacob's, pardon me, Joseph's additional descendants in Egypt. In the Hebrew text, they're not counted in the number. But in the Greek text, seven of them are counted. So when you total it up, the way the Hebrew text leaves out some in its count, which didn't put him in, you see the 70 and the 75. Uh, the issue is, is it legitimate for one person to say this was a number, this was the number? It's legitimate, but it still makes me wonder, why did Stephen say one number and the Old Testament say another? Here, here's another. Acts chapter 7, verse 6, still Stephen. God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Okay, you have 400 years. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. How might you explain that difference? Yeah, routed it off. Uh, we do it all the time. 
but uh, can you do it legitimately, biblically? I think you could. Uh, there's a second possible answer. Uh, for instance, Stephen simply rounded off the number. Or secondly, and I don't like this answer, but it's possible, Stephen made a mistake. And his mistake is just recorded. I have a hard time with that because Luke presents it as though Stephen is giving us the true facts. So I have a hard time thinking it's just recording his error. Number three, Stephen may have given us some details based on issues we don't know. There are times, folks, that when you have one historian who writes from one viewpoint, and uh, let me see, I think I've given you an example here. Let's go to the next one. Differences in numbers, that's, that's one particular. There's also differences in facts or description depending on how an author uh, does it. Now here's, here's our illustration. Tell me what's happening here. You are recording this for us. In one sentence, describe what's going on here. Somebody, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. What's that? Tug of war. Okay, that's all you want to say about it. Tug of war. Somebody else describe it for me. Oh, come on, folks. That's an easy one. Huh? Men playing tug of war. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, would think you would come up with an answer like that, Dwayne, but okay. Let's, let's make some statements about this. Is this a true statement? A group of men was playing tug of war. What do you see here? Well, you know that, but is this a true statement? Right here. Yeah. How about this statement? A sailor was playing tug of war. Well, this is a, at least this one guy up front has on a sailor's outfit, so I assume he is, but doesn't say anything about the other guys. But did I make a true statement? Yes. Yeah. Or how about this? Three men in green shirts were playing tug of war. You can't see it too well from your picture, but I count three men in green shirts. Now, is that true? It is true. Now, if I said, huh? Well, I, don't, I mean, let's be easy with my illustrations, if you will. Now, how about this one? Twenty women in pink shirts were playing tug of war. Could have been. See, again, we're assuming you're here, but you can't see it from the picture. If I'm here and... I have an attraction to the women in the pink shirts, and I described them playing tug of war, but you, you like the fact there were some men. And it's legitimate for us to describe what's going on. Now, the issue of inerrancy is whether I say there were only three men playing tug of war. Well, I can see there are more than three. Or if I said there were only women playing this. Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to get at? You weren't there and I was not there in certain situations when uh, the writers of Scripture give us different details. You have to ask, are their details consistent with what they saw? Now let me give you one of the normal um, Issues that people say is an error in Scripture. Matthew 27, verse 37, talking about the inscription on the cross, this is the way Matthew described it. He said, The inscription said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark said, in Mark 15, 26, the inscription read, The King of the Jews. Luke said, Luke 23, 38, This is the King of the Jews. John 19.19 19 records it as Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, is this an error? I don't believe so. I think what each of them was doing, and you remember it was written in different languages, the whole statement probably was, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It is legitimate for one author to give some details and not the other. The only thing that would go against inerrancy is if one said, the only thing it said was this. 
you, do you understand the point here? Uh, different people writing history will come up with different details. So we've got differences in numbers. And, you know, one of the hardest ones, uh, and I wasn't even going to try to explain this one to you, the circumference of the, of the um, oh, what, what was the thing they had in the temple, you know, that they had the water in, the brazen, um, bronze yeah, the bronze laver. Uh, uh, there are some who say, oh, they have an error there because pi equals, and they go into all this. I don't try to explain that one. I'll let you go through some of the books that explain that. But there are differences in numbers for a good reason. Check them out. There are differences in facts or description. There is a third thing. There are differences in cultures and idioms. Let me show you one of the passages where people say there is a, an error. Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the kings and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now, you look at this passage, and, and the uh, critics will say, wait a minute, Nebuchadnezzar, his father? Nebuchadnezzar was not his father. When people use this argument, I want to go, dummy, you didn't even do a little bit of your homework. Because you can go through the Old Testament and see statements like this, whereas you have the term father or son of, uh, in the Hebrew culture, refers to a descendant, not just a next of kin sort of thing. It, it can mean that. But it doesn't always. For instance, you say, Jesus, son of? <laughs> They're having a tough time tonight. Jesus, son of? David. David. Ah, good. Uh, was he the next in line? Of? No. But, but it means a descendant of. A and it's fair to do that in that culture. There are many cultures who say things differently. I might say to you, if you're kidding me, don't, don't pull my leg. In Spanish, what would they say? Don't pull my hair. No me tome ese pelo. Well, it's, the st it's just a different culture, different way of saying it. Now, here's what I want to get to this evening. And I've, I've taken two nights on the Bible. Couldn't possibly cover everything, but, but I hope this will help you to understand. You do not need to feel foolish or uneducated for believing the Bible to be God's inerrant word. It's work having to deal with the details. And, and I don't mind somebody taking a, a, a difference of opinion on things as long as they've done their homework. But if I can go back and show you didn't do your homework, or you're not fair to the facts, or you're not, you're not fair to the culture, or you can't explain this in the right ways, then I have every reason to believe that God has given me his inerrant word. And I personally have the foundation that if it's not inerrant, it's not from God. That's my personal belief. Having said all that, do we have questions or comments? Because I want to take a few minutes to do that before we pray. Yes. Why is that so? Why did you stress that? The resurrection is important because if Jesus did not die and rise again, number one, it doesn't fulfill the scriptures that said he would. Uh, number two, he was not God. If he died and he didn't rise again, he's not the Son of God. So the resurrection is a, uh, a, a foundational point. If Jesus didn't rise again, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, might as well forget it. That's the loose Faulkner paraphrase. Reverse standard version. <laughs> Other uh, questions or comments? Yes, sir. Arturo. I have, uh, I have read different translations. 
translation in Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, a few days ago, I was reading uh, one the English version and then the Spanish Spanish version, and I noticed that there was a word missing on the Spanish. So my question is, should, should we uh, trust any version, or what version should we trust? Yeah. What Spanish version were you using? Uh, I think it was uh, Reina. La Reina. Uh, La Reina is a good version. Let me let me try to uh, give your question so that we can hear on the tape. The, the question is. Uh, in, in, in Spanish, you can go through a translation. In English, you can go through a translation. In fact, in English, you can go through lots of translations. And sometimes you do not have the same thing there. Now, that's a big question in, in one sense because there are passages, and I don't know which one you had in mind. There are passages like in Mark 16 where there is a a disagreement whether or not it should even have the extra verses. That's a whole theological issue in itself. Some translators have put it in with a footnote and says it's not found in some manuscripts, it is in others. However, there are other issues where a translator has to make a decision as to how he's going to translate this particular issue. This is why uh, you, you know, there are times I will say to you, I use the New American Standard Bible. That's the one I prefer. But there are times when I don't like its translation. Uh, I don't either, the translators gave me uh, their opinion on what it was, and I look back at the, uh, at the facts and I go, I don't think you chose the right translation. So this is why in any translation, if you have a difference, and you're not going to find too many differences, but if you have one, then you've got to go back and dig and see why did they include this, why did they not. Now, I will tell you that the La Reina version in Spanish, there are times, in fact, even the other day I got it out because I, I thought, Maybe this will give me a different idea in Spanish that I'm not understanding in English. Because there are times, for instance, when I was in uh, 1 Thessalonians and teaching in Mexico, I thought the Spanish translation was better than the English translation just because it gave me a, a different idea of what they thought the word meant. But as far as the translations, it doesn't really matter which one you find. You're going to find most of the time they will agree in the basics. If they don't, do your homework to try to figure out why. Why is there a difference here? Okay. Well, there are the, the question is, who decides on the translations of the Bible? For instance, in English, what translations can you think of? King James, the NIV, New International Version, NASB. You've got the NEV, the New English Version. You have the RSV. Now, the New King James. So... Somewhere along the way, somebody said, I think we need to come out with a new translation because I don't like the translation here. Anytime I can think of they've done that, there's always been an organized group of scholars who got together to do it. Somebody paid the money to have it done. Now, here's what happens. So, this group puts out their translation, and then all the other scholars go, oh, no. I don't like the way they did here, and so they write a book how these translators didn't translate it right. That's why you read commentaries and you read, okay, why did they believe this translation was the better one than this one here? Again, it's, 
most of the time wouldn't make a bit of difference for you, but sometimes it does. That's why you go back and you study, or you have El Pastor who teaches you. Again, I don't know that that totally will answer your question, but most of the time, for instance, there are times when I'm preaching that I will use uh, the message paraphrase or the living Bible paraphrase. Anytime somebody makes a paraphrase, they have to interpret what it means. They're not giving you a literal word-for-word -word interpretation. Why do I use a paraphrase? Sometimes because it's easier for me to use their paraphrase than to spend 20 minutes trying to explain why I think this means this. But don't do your study in a paraphrase. It just kind of gives you the idea. Bobby. And the, the, the problem of translators is a tough one. For instance, um, yeah, and this is a story, whether it's urban legend or not, it's a story I've heard, that the translators were trying to translate uh, John 129. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, they've got a choice. Do they translate that as, Behold the Lamb of God, and in that culture they had no lambs? Do, do they translate that as that, or do they try to get a cultural, what they think is a uh, parallel? Now what I understand is that some translators decided to translate it, Behold the Pig of God. That has its own cultural problems. That is not a cultural um, equal. Uh, it has all sorts of difficulties in it. For instance, Sharon used to uh, work for a man who was the head of one of the uh, departments in American Board of Mission to the Jews. He wrote a book called uh, Satan in the Sanctuary. He had a title of one of the chapters called, he called it the, oh, I don't know, the bloody war or something. They would not take that chapter title because bloody in English has more of a crass cultural idea to it. That's always the problem with translation. Again, if I'm trying to translate the statement this man was kidding him. I could either put it word for word, or I could try a cultural equivalent. Well, if I take, try the cultural equivalent, equivalent, do I go, this man was pulling his leg? Or do I go, this man was pulling his hair? See, those are the difficulties in translation, because just because you translate it for these people, so they understand it doesn't mean you translate it for these people, so they do. Now let me give you one statement about translations while we're here. Years ago you probably heard that the um, New International was trying to feminize the scriptures uh, by using passages that said he and they were taking it as person rather than giving it a... a you know, a he rather than masculine rather than feminine. I went to a seminar where they were speaking about that issue and they took us to several passages saying, okay, what would you do with this passage? How would you translate it so that people understand what is here? And I have to tell you, having listened to the translators that, that gave us the new New International, I saw their problem, and I don't think they were trying to feminize Scripture at all. I think they were trying to be fair to what the words say and, and how people understand them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the no, the Dead Sea Scrolls is only Old Testament uh, well, books. Well, how are they preserved? How are they preserved? <laughs> 
Uh, again, we don't have a preservation of all the originals. What we have are copies. Uh, for instance, the, the copies of the Dead, the Dead Sea Scroll copies, uh, they were put in a cave, they were in some um, uh, terracotta urns, and they were preserved through the years. What's interesting is these were copies that were written, oh, let's say the Old Testament, you've got about 4,000 years of, of records. We're talking about copies that were made way after the fact and yet they were not, I can't remember the exact percentage, we'll round it off. 99% without any deviation from the other Masoretic texts that we have because they were so careful with it. Now, we don't have too many copies of the Old Testament. The New Testament, we have thousands and thousands of copies. And so it's pretty easy to go back and go, oh, I see how they made this mistake, or I see how they, uh, and that's just the science of, uh, of looking at the text. Does that help answer the question? Yes, ma'am. Stella. Yes. And a paraphrase is they don't go all the way back. Usually they don't go all the way back to the original. A paraphrase, you have to decide what do you think the passage means. A translation is trying to give you word for word comparison. Again, it's hard to know how to do that comparison sometimes. Good news for modern man. You may remember that uh, came out years ago. They translated blood, they said, hey, gang members on the streets of L.A. or Chicago or New York, blood means nothing to them. So they took the word blood and translated it death. I think they made a wrong choice. Death and blood are not uh, synonymous terms. I know why they did it, but I think they made the wrong choice in their translation. Anything else? Okay, well, you've all been very patient through what is uh, pretty detailed stuff. Uh, next week, we'll talk about Satan, how he came about, and how he opposes God. That won't be detailed at all, so you'll be glad to get into that. All righty, we have some uh, things to pray about.